Attendees are in listen-only mode. Right, good afternoon or good morning uh, to everyone who's joining us today. Uh, my name is Jean-Pierre Roux. Uh, I'm based at uh, South South North in Cape Town, South Africa. And uh, I'll be introducing the session today um, as well as um, fielding the questions later. Um, firstly, it's great to, to have everyone with us today. I think we had uh, 165 uh, registrations as of this morning and uh, currently um, about 59 attendees. Um, so we're quite excited uh, for the turnout. Um, so firstly, uh, a couple of introductions before I hand over to Neil. Um, I'm based at the Coordination Hub for the Future Climate for Africa program. Uh, and as some of you might know, um, Future Climate for Africa is a five-year research program uh, funded by the British uh, Department for International Development and the Natural Environment Research Council. And the aims are really to, to generate fundamentally new climate science um, for the continent. Um, it's a collaboration between about uh, 60 uh, research institutions and civil society organizations across Africa uh, and Europe. And um, apart from generating uh, new climate science, it also has a focus on, on the application of this science uh, to inform um, development decision making uh, in very particular contexts. Uh, and it's, it's really looking at uh, particularly the long term, uh, the long term plan horizons uh, and forecast those. Now um, I'll introduce Neil shortly, and he'll be drawing uh, his his talk will be drawing on. Uh, some work that he did for um, one of our outputs which came out last year, which is um, Africa's Climate Report, uh, which you can access uh, online, and I believe the, the link is available in the slideshow that you're, that you're currently seeing. And that was really a, a collaboration between uh, many of the researchers uh, on the program. So uh, I direct you to the uh, www.futureclimateafrica.org uh, website for further information. Right, so on to our uh, webinar for today. Um, which is really forming part of a much longer series of webinars uh, over the next couple of years. Um, but first up, we have uh, Dr. Neil Hart from uh, the University um, of Oxford. Um, Neil grew up in Cape Town, South Africa, and uh, completed his studies at, at the University of Cape Town. Uh, spent several years working at the University of Reading on windstorms of Europe, and has found his way back to working on Southern African climate um, at the University of Oxford. Uh, and uh, as advertised today, he's going to be focusing on, on Central and Southern Africa's climate. Now, um, last note before I hand over, because we have many participants and in an attempt to leave sufficient time for um, questions, um, I'll be moderating them. If you do have a question, please add it in the tab on the right of your screen. There's a, a questions drop-down menu where you can add written questions. Uh, I'll be keeping my eyes on those, and once Neil is done with his um, presentation, timed at about just over 15 minutes, um, I will um, curate uh, the questions and I will pose it to Neil uh, verbally, uh, the selected questions. So please do uh, write them down uh, in the comments or questions box. Right. Uh, with that, I hand over to Neil. Well, welcome everyone that's uh, online. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, start off by saying, what have you always wanted to know about the climate of Central and Southern Africa? Well, uh, let me just say that I can't assume to know what you know already, uh, and nor can I assume to know what you want to know. Uh, I don't know the specific climate risks that matter to you, and so instead the goal of this webinar will be to give those of you listening a good base from which to start conversations with climate researchers and climate information providers. To do so, I'll be using a number of examples unique to the Southern African climate system. And through these examples, I'll attempt to give insight into how we model the weather and climate of Earth. I'll try to explain the issues of uncertainty that surround climate information, especially as we look at smaller and smaller regions. Sometimes very clear and certain statements can be made about climate and future climate, and other times this is impossible. And towards the end, there'll be examples that illustrate how this is often related to the specific question being asked or decision being considered. 
Finally, I'll give some insights into the future of climate modeling. And this is really to bring home the point that we can, what we can say about future climate is always changing and often improving. And part of this is because the modeling tools are changing and improving. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So it might be useful to start with an overview of why we have the seasonal cycle of wet seasons and dry seasons across Southern Africa. Much of the rainfall, of centr much of the rainfall across Central and Southern Africa is from thunderstorms. The coastal regions are an exception with other types of, uh, other types of coastal rain. So the satellite image that you should now be seeing is an example of what widespread thunderstorm activity looks like from space. So this is just an example image from a, a January a couple of years ago. You should be able to make out the outline of Africa. The area that's colored a dark is because it's warm. So for example, you're seeing the desert regions here and the clouds are white because they're a lot colder. Areas that experience frequent thunderstorms will be having their wet season and the timing of these seasons is related to the yearly movement of this area of frequent thunderstorm activity. So at the moment it's over the cent center of Africa. And this is illustrated with this next image. So the map is of Africa and the colors indicate the frequency of widespread thunderstorms, much like the storms shown in the previous image. In this case, light blue is where thunderstorms might occur and darker blue to red shows where they are very likely. And this is from 30 years of satellite observation. The three figures show how the area of thunderstorms moves south from August over North Africa uh, through to January over Southern Africa. It also highlights how certain areas get frequent widespread thunderstorms often linked to where the mountains are. So you can see over here, this is a very mountainous uh, area, the Ru Ruwenzori Mountains, and you can see that um, season there. So the south of movement is what explains the short rain, as, as noted below, the short rains for much, much of East Africa. Similarly, as these next images show from January to June, you see the northward movement of thunderstorm activity and this is what explains the long rains. So it's from March that the long rains for East Africa start as this area is moving north again. Of course, if you live in either the southern or northern parts of tropical Africa, so for example Zimbabwe, Zambia or up in the Sahel region, you'll only get one season of rainfall and that's when the thunderstorms have reached their most northern or southern positions. In addition to this broad movement of thunderstorm activity, local features such as lakes or mountains will change what rainfall seasons are experienced. Um, and we'll mention a little, little bit about, for example, Lake Victoria, which can make its own microclimate uh, because of, because of um, there being such a big lake there. So what's useful is to think about how we can build a climate model, uh, or alternatively, just what are the important factors for, re for, for, for the regional climate over Southern Africa. So this schematic is what appears in the, um, the Central and Southern African part of the report um, discussing regional variability and change. Uh, there's a lot going on in this schematic, so we're going to start off with it being a little bit simpler and build it up. To also point off that, just going back to uh, the, the, the previous point about climate models, they're tools. Um, you would, would you use a hammer to cut down a tree? No. And similarly, it's not advisable to use a hand drill without a basic knowledge of how it works. So our, if our use of a climate model is to be profitable, we need to understand how they work and what they can do. And this is at the heart of our climate research in the Mfula project and they remain the main tool we have to understand how climate may change in the coming years. The schematic you now see on your screen, as I've mentioned, is the one that, um, that, that appears in the report that you can find online. So going to this figure, this is what I've already shown. I've shown that Southern Africa has regions covered by thunderstorms and these, this thunderstorm activity moves north and south. So you can see the cartoon clouds as shown by this arrow. Um, and there's lightning bolts to indicate the lightning. The gray shading on this figure shows mountains. Uh, where there's black, this is high altitudes. Um, and so I mentioned 
the, the mountains over here causing that extra thunderstorm activity in the previous slide. Uh, and white is the low-lying coastal areas. And you can also see the main lakes on this image. Now, the two main ingredients needed for thunderstorms are the sun's heating and warm, moist air. And it's the fact that the sun's heating moves south as summer develops over southern Africa that we have the southward movement of the thunderstorm activity. But without the fuel of warm, moist air, the storms can't develop. And now if you're near a lake, this can provide the fuel for these storms as water evaporates from the lake surface. And this means that places like Lake Victoria can have their own microclimates with local thunderstorms. But what about the rest of the sub subcontinent? Well, on both the east and the west sides, there are warm oceans. And winds blow the warm, moist air from the oceans over the continent. And this helps fuel the wet season rainfall. These are represented here by the transparent red arrows. This figure also now includes a band of cloud across the southern parts of the continent. These are tropical temperate troughs, and they are important for rainfall across Botswana, South Africa, and Mozambique. So to be able to simulate the thunderstorms over southern Africa, these moisture transports need to be accurate. Now with the weather forecast, it is only trying to predict where the rainfall or dry areas will be for the next five days. So you can start a weather forecast with the ob current observed winds and moisture transports. And you do this each day, and in this way, keep the modeled atmosphere very close to the real atmosphere. That is why weather forecasts are generally quite good. For a seasonal forecast, we are able to model what the ocean temperatures might be like for the next three months. And we then hope the seasonal forecast model is accurate enough to simulate the correct moisture transports in three months' time. But for a climate model, we can only hope that we have made it good enough to simulate both the ocean temperatures and the moisture transports correctly for the next 50 years or more. The only change we can make is the concentration of carbon dioxide. So if you need a real-life example, you can think of it a bit like bringing up a child. When the child is young, you can offer much correction to make, he or she, make sure he or she behaves appropriately. As the child gets older, you hope that you have taught the child good values and they will continue to live well in your society. But you still can offer some correction every, every now and then. But as the child reaches adulthood, you can offer very little correction and you have to hope that you have taught your child all you can during their early years to ensure that their adult years are successful. A weather forecast is a bit like a young child, which we can correct every day. A seasonal forecast is a bit like a teenage child who you can only correct sometimes. And the climate model projection is like the adult. You have to hope you have included all the appropriate laws of the climate so that it simulates the future as best as possible. This is why weather forecasts are inherently more accurate than climate models. But it means that what we can understand from the climate models is very different and much further in the future. So hopefully that illustration helps a bit. And with things like these moisture transports, different climate models simulate them slightly with slightly different strengths, which might not matter when you consider all of southern Africa, but if you're interested in rainfall in only a small part, such as Malawi, this could be a problem. More on this later. A moment ago I mentioned that thunderstorms are fueled by the warm, moist air from lakes or from nearby oceans. But the challenge is that those as those thunderstorms grow and strengthen together, they can start to change the wind patterns over southern Africa. At the moment, our models need to estimate this effect because they can't actually simulate individual storms. But within Future Climate for Africa, a climate model is running at the Met Office as we speak, which is in fact simulating individual thunderstorms. And this is across the whole of, southern, the whole of Africa, south and north. We will be trying to understand what is the effect of thunderstorms on the winds and moisture transports when we no longer have to estimate this effect but can simulate it directly. And this is just one example of how the climate information available is always changing and every so often we make big leaps with improved climate models. Anyway, moving back to our schematic of Southern African climate. We next have to include the large-scale circulation features which govern the strength and direction of the winds across much of southern Africa. Included here 
on the South Atlantic and South Indian highs and on the continent, the Angola low. Now much of our research is in looking into where these circulation systems are placed in the climate models and how strong they are. Much of what I've spoken about to this point has been about winds near the surface, the wind or moisture transport you would experience if you stood on the ground or in a boat. The last ingredient we need to include is the winds that are high above the surface. That's about the altitude that international aeroplane flights fly at. These are represented here in the green lines and arrows. We need to make sure that climate models are simulating the correct strength and waviness, so to speak, of these upper level winds, as they're also important in controlling the placement and timing of the thunderstorms, especially over the southern parts. Uh, so in this schematic, this wave in the upper level flow is associated with these thunderstorms that happen across um, from Botswana over southern Africa. Finally, we try to make models that can include the simulation of extremes. And now the image includes tropical cyclones and cutoff lows. But sometimes very rare events happen, such as the flood in southern Malawi and Mozambique in 2014. So the area is indicated with the arrow. A tropical cyclone formed over the continent, which hardly ever happens. And at the moment, we don't think our current climate models will be able to simulate that type of very rare and unlikely event, at least not yet. Now, climate models are remarkably good at simulating all of the features in the schematic. And this is part of why we have confidence in predictions about global climate change. But as you look more and more closely, the uncertainty grows and the confidence decreases. I'll explain why. In this image, you have the average change to the seasonal cycle of thunderstorms produced by El Nino seasons. So we had a big El Nino season in 2016, um, 2015, 2016, and this sort of pattern is a general example of what happens. Um, so you have in blue uh, more thunderstorm activity and in red less thunderstorm activity. Uh, this is in the December, and you can see that as you move into the February, it's more just a case of less thunderstorm activity in this band across from uh, ang southern Angola all the way to Mozambique through Zambia and Zimbabwe. If you're interested in what this means for Malawi, well, the problem is that you might have more rainfall in the north and less rainfall in the south. If we made a decision about water managed based on that, but what happens is that the climate models are not always that precise. And Malawi is a small c country, so the climate models might produce the same pattern that we see in this picture, but shifted only a little bit south. And if we made a decision about water management based on that climate model, we would say the whole country would be wetter. And if the similar if the whole country might be forecast to be drier if this pattern was shifted northwards. And we might find different climate models, one that says that it's wetter and one that says that it's drier, and that's part of the challenge. So a lot of climate research is needed to better understand the climate models, especially as we zoom in on different parts of the continent. So just because climate models are not perfect and there are uncertainties, it doesn't mean that they're not useful. And much of their usefulness comes when we use them to address specific decisions which have risk or change associated with weather or climate. Firstly, it's important to consider the relevance of climate for your decisions or your particular problem. Uh, what you have here is um, a figure that's appeared in a paper by Rob Wilby and Suraj Desai. And it shows the cascade of uncertainties. And so in this, you can see that for a particular adaptation response, and this could be anything, you start off with what your future society is, you have what are, what are we actually going to do in terms of emitting carbon dioxide, and then you have a climate model. So they're only a part of the uncertainty here. Um, and so there's a number of decisions where the climate is only a small influence um, for that decision. 
we'll have some aspects of, and the thing is we'll have confidence in some aspects of climate and future change and very little confidence in others. Generally speaking, there's confidence that Southern Africa will get warmer, but lack of confidence about whether it will get wetter or drier. So this temperature, the confidence in temperature, there's a nice example that's come out of work um, at University of Cape Town with colleagues in Mozambique. I'm sure many of you have heard of the tsetse fly that carries human sleeping sickness and cattle illnesses. Well, this fly has a specific life cycle that can only withstand a certain number of very hot days during reproduction. And the researchers have been able to show that the timing and duration of very hot spells in Mozambique in the next 50 years is likely to wipe out the tsetse fly. So this is an example where the confidence in climate models really narrows down the uncertainties. Um, and so there's a clear message that in the future it's unlikely that there will be tsetse fly in certain parts of Mozambique. And this has implications for the types of cattle that people will be able to keep in those areas. Similarly, there seems to be a growing understanding that extreme daily rainfall in the future might be more intense when it does rain. In contrast, we still have much uncertainty about future change in a number of aspects of rainfall over Central and Southern Africa. For some of the reasons shown before, we are not sure if there will be change in the start of the rainy season. And even at the larger scale, some models show that the climate will dry and others show it will get wet. This does depend on where you are on the continent, but it highlights uncertainty exists. In order to manage this uncertainty, a number of people are working on decision-making under uncertainty. And here is an example of how that might work. So let's say you're planning a big water investment. It could be a dam, irrigation, a managed wetland. It could be anything. You know that your investment can work if you have a range of annual rainfall, which is shown here on the uh, y-axis. And as long as the drought periods do not last too long, shown here on the x-axis, this can be thought of as your decision space. You then come to someone who knows something about the climate of the region. And they're able to engage with your specific problem and see what climate information is relevant. And they can map this information onto your decision space. So these dots are examples from climate models which are showing what the what future mean precipitation change might be like and how drought duration might change. Now, as you can see, the, the climate information uh, specialist in this case doesn't have a very accurate answer for you. Um, uh, these, the, the, these dots are a bit all over the map. But they are able to, by understanding the behavior of climate models, tell you that you can probably ignore certain models. And so, for example, uh, they can understand what the models are doing. They're saying that these models that produce this answer are moving the, um, the, the, the seasonal cycle of thunderstorms is happening much later. And so you have a delay in the migration of the uh, tropical rainfall. But they might be able to tell you that these models here show a different drier circulation to what's normally observed. And there's reason to believe that these models are really not very good. Um, so you have information about what part of the climate information you should, you should listen to. And from this, you can now try and change your plans to ensure that despite not having a clear understanding of the future, you can make a wise water investment, something like that. So you ensure that your, uh, your water investment can deal with a future climate that maps within these models. So that brings us to the end. Just to summarize what, what I've told you today. The seasonal movement of thunderstorm activity controls much of Central and Southern African climate. Small changes in this movement between years can have big changes on local African climates, as we discussed for Malawi. We said that climate models can simulate this movement, but the precision is not always great for very small areas. And this is particularly true for seasonal forecasts and even more so for climate projections. Also, the fact that the certainty with which we can say something about future climate often depends on the very specific climate variable that is important for your decision. As we noted about the, thunder, the effect of thunderstorms and being able to simulate them directly, we are knowing that climate models improve and our regional climate understanding is advancing. And this means that the climate information available for your different contexts continues to become more relevant. 
And finally, with climate-related decisions, there is rarely one answer that fits all. And this webinar was intended to provide some background to help you have conversations and find answers which are relevant for your specific contexts. Thank you. Um, and just to, to, to follow up, uh, there are two more seminar, uh, webinars that are, are in the plans. Um, the one is going to be a lot more detail about uh, this final bit of the talk, about how we can use climate models in planning. Uh, and then there'll be a little bit more about how we have these conversations um, to make better decision making with climate information. Thank you. All right, Neil, thank you very much for um, a very interesting discussion. Um, an overview of, of some of the fundamentals of regional climate. Um, and, and uh, specific questions and good examples around, around uh, prompting us to think about how it might be applied at national scales uh, on various contexts uh, and decision-making under uncertainty. I wonder if maybe for the sake of posing questions, or you want to go back two slides to the, to the summary um, learning, just to great for the audience. Um, so we have had a couple of questions come in through um, the question field, and uh, now is your chance to add some more. Um, I have uh, two questions, um, Neil, to put to you. One, uh, both of them are from uh, Sheikh Tidian Wade from Senegal, who also works on the uh, prize project. Yes. And um, these relate to West Africa, so technically not geographically uh, part of the focus today, but um, you might still have something to, to say on this. Um, and Sheikh's first question is, um, He's wondering if it would be possible to use uh, climate information or climate models to help migrants make uh, resilient investments with their remittances. Um. <clears throat> uh, well, that, that's a very interesting question. Um, I probably don't have a very good answer for you. Uh, I think, as I, as I said, that I mean, that's a very specific context. Um, and there is a lot of work that's happening in the, in the larger investment um, industry, uh, for example, investments of pensions and that sort of thing, where they're trying to make climate safe uh, or climate resilient um, investments. So ensuring that, for example, they don't invest uh, all their money in a shopping mall that is being built in a floodplain, and we know that river is likely to flood quite often in the future. Um, th that's an example, but I think that uh, it's certainly something that people are thinking about. Um, and it would be quite specific on, on um, exactly what's happening. I, I, I think that perhaps the, the best bet is to, to um, think about uh, contacting the people that are in the, in the bigger investment houses that are starting to think quite carefully about ensuring that sort of investments for the future are safe to climate risks. Sure, and thanks for that. And the second question I have also on that region, and, and I might add something in there around um, AMA 2050, which is the FCFA consortium working in the West African region. But uh, the second question is um, also from Sheikh, uh, can we have specific models for semi-arid lands in West Africa, uh, referring to Senegal and Burkina? Uh, so Sheikh, we can't have specific models for those lands. Um, but part of what's happening in the Future Climate for Africa program is that we're using the models we have and trying to understand how good they are at simulating specific regions like that. Um, so what's typically happened with regional climate modeling is that um, there's been a lot of research to try and understand, for example, uh, what the changes are in the mid-latitudes, so um, areas like Australia or over Europe. Uh, and there's been less work focusing on trying to understand how good the models are at simulating um, places like the semi-arid parts of um, the Sahel. And so we can't have specific models for that, but what we can do is use the models we have and try and understand where they're good, where they're bad, and improve them. Um, in the semi-arid areas, this will be particularly related to uh, changes in soil moisture. So in semi-arid areas, you can have very wet patches of soil and dry patches of soil. Um, 
uh, depending on where the rain has recently fallen. Thanks, Neil. And to that, I would add for, for Sheikh is that um, uh, whilst the consortium that Neil is working in that currently is focusing largely on Central and Southern Africa, the Mfula consortium, uh, there's another research consortium called um, AMA 2050, uh, which you may be aware of, which is focusing on West Africa. And um, more information as well as contact details for reaching them you can find on AMA2050.org. Um, <clears throat> and that's being headed up by the, the Center for Ecology and Hydrology in Wallingford, uh, together with several African partners. So um, might be good to direct further queries uh, to them. Neil, we've got another question from uh, Ellen Kalmbach. Um, and she asks, uh, given the increasing uncertainty of climate predictions uh, when moving towards local scales, uh, would you agree that for projects working at community level, uh, a participatory trend analysis of observed changes will, at the moment, be a good and resource-friendly basis for predictions over the next 20 years? Uh, yeah, thanks for that question, um, Ellen. Uh, yes, I think I largely would agree. Um, a lot of the change that we are uh, able to to understand happens on timescales longer than 20 years. And so for the next 20 years, um, focusing on uh, what you have of local observations is probably a good bet, especially if the local community is already poorly adapted to the climate it has been experiencing. Um, but it is important to recognize that with climate change, uh, we can start to have extreme events, for example, that we've never experienced before. Uh, one example was that tropical cyclone that spun up over Malawi and Mozambique. Um, and that means that those participatory approaches are, are definitely a way forward, but the climate researchers or people that know climate researchers within those approaches uh, should continue to have conversations with these researchers so that they become alerted to um, c clear changes which are even specific at the local regions. Um, I mentioned the example of this growing trend that it looks like we'll have more intense precipitation when it does rain in the future. Um, and, and that's something where the, it, it's, a general, it's a general answer about climate change. Um, wherever you have thunderstorm rainfall. Thanks, Neil. Um, I see there's an, a hand up by uh, Oforo Kimombo. Um, I see you've put your hand up. We're just accepting questions via the, the questions tab. So if you, if you wouldn't mind uh, typing it in there, that would be appreciated. Um, uh, a question from Peter Baker, uh, Neil, are you looking at the effects of land use change, deforestation as it affects uh, recycling of rainfall across the region? Um, yeah, thanks Peter. Uh, at the moment, not directly, but it is something that we're very much aware of and within the uh, larger project, um, th 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 there's a number of consortia within Future Climate for Africa uh, and one of them is dealing with modeling across the whole of Africa, pan-African uh, climate models. And in that, there's a number of people from CEH, the Center for Ecology and Hydrology, um, uh, which is near Oxford, uh, and they do a lot of work trying to study those questions. Um, and there's, it's definitely an important thing. Uh, land use change can have quite big impact on the local climate. Um, but as I say, it's not something we're working on directly, but yes, it's important. Uh, a question from uh, Kristen Kennedy. At the beginning of the talk, Neil, you mentioned that coastal areas have their own meteorological patterns. Uh, what needs to be done differently to project climate in coastal areas? Um, yeah, it's not so much. My main point was that the coastal areas, a lot of their rainfall often isn't due to thunderstorms, and it's due to moist air moving in from the sea and hitting the land and that can cause um, shallow rainfall. Uh, there's a lot of work that's being done on researching that um, 
th this is particularly important, in fact, um, uh, in the G Gulf of Guinea coastal area. So the West African monsoon causes uh, big thunderstorms for the Sahel, but along the coastal area, there's a lot of research happening on, on the shallow rain. Um, and a lot of that is related to, to slightly different processes. It's related to the boundary layer in the model, so uh, what's happening close to the surface. Um, it just means that when conclusions are drawn about what the thunderstorms are doing, they don't always apply directly to what's happening at the coast, which in part answers your question, I think. Um, <clears throat> Right, so I've got a question from Gloria Edwards. Um, fairly general, uh, a question about decadal predictions and what the uncertainties are, some more information about uncertainties at, at decadal timescales. Uh, thanks, Gloria. So decadal prediction is quite um, a new science. Uh, it's something that started um, with the last uh, round of, of, of climate models, so the CMIP-5 um, uh, model intercomparison project. And at the moment, part of the trouble is that when you, so we are talking about the fact that with a weather forecast, you can always correct it to the currently observed winds and currently observed moisture transports. Um, and a lot of our improvements in weather forecasting and seasonal forecasting have come because we are much better able to pull the model world back to our observed world. Um, and there's a lot of research that's going into better understand how to do that with um, decadal forecasts, because decadal forecasts depend on our ability to forecast slowly varying changes in ocean temperatures. Um, and so I would say that we're likely to see substantial progress in the next five years in decadal prediction. We we currently are making progress in that. So it's not something I work on directly, but I have colleagues that do. Um, but I, I think to, to point out that decadal prediction is a is a much more immature science than, for example, weather forecasting and even seasonal forecasting. Uh, I guess it's kind of like in the analogy of the bringing up a child, it's like the 20-year-old um, and, and we don't yet know quite how to correct the 20-year-old as an analogy. Right, this is obviously our first child sticking with the analogy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thanks, Neil. So just for the attendees, before we move on, we've got two more questions. Um, these questions are not only useful for the current discussion, uh, but they will be informing um, um, our scoping of future webinars. Um, this is the third FCFA webinar that we've had in the past year. Some of them have dealt more with uh, specific questions around application um, of climate data. Some of them, as this one, with more fundamentals around climate science. Um, but um, if you have uh, any further questions that you'd like to add to the questions tab that also might relate to your need on, on information for other topics that you find interesting, please do. Uh, please do add them. Um, we'll take them into account. Right, so um, I have uh, that one, three more questions. We've got, I believe, 20 minutes left, so more than enough time. Um, next question is from... Uh, Martin Rukutsky. <laughs> um, sorry, no, Oforo Kimambu. Um, his question is, can we have climate models for predicting algal blooms in the lakes? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so there, uh, there's a lot of research that's going on to doing that both in the lakes and uh, at coastal areas. It's something which has a big word called biogeophysical modeling or biogeochemical modeling um, and there's a lot of people that are both modelers and biologists that are trying to build models that can take information from climate models, they're trying to build um, algal bloom models which take information from climate models such as winds, rainfall, temperature and they use that to simulate the, the, the development of um, the biology in lakes or in coastal ocean areas um, and that's part of ongoing work to, to improve um, 
our ability to to manage those lakes. Um, there's a lot of work that already exists on um, managing those lakes from space, so detecting uh, algal blooms, especially if they're harmful from from satellites. Uh, but there is a lot of work that's happening um, in that in that space of biogeochemical modeling. So the answer is yes. Um, then next, a very um, interesting question, one that interests me uh, as well as issues around the evaluation of climate services uh, and, and investments in climate science um, from Martin Rokitsky. And um, Neil, do you have an impression of um, the current existing capacity in the region to make a decision on whether climate information is actually relevant uh, to answer particular decision-making uh, context vis-a-vis uh, -vis other types of information? and um, whether in this view a significant investment of time and resources dealing with climate information is justified or worth it? Uh, yeah, thanks for your question, Martin. Um, uh, I'm probably going to answer part of your question, not, not all of it. As I said, I think it's very, it depends very specifically on the context. So if you are building, a, making a big uh, infrastructure investment, that's going to be uh, sensitive to climate information and future climate change, it's probably worthwhile uh, spending, in terms of the budget of that sort of um, investment and the life scale of it, it's probably worthwhile spending the money getting as best an understanding of the climate um, impacts as possible. And for some of those decisions, observed climate, so the past hundred years, if that data is available, will be sufficient to make an informed decision. Um, but for other things, it will be necessary to, to consider future climate. Um, in terms of capacity in the region, I think that, that that continues to grow. And a lot of the climate projects, like the one that I'm working on, um, have a big aspect of working with the local researchers um, to to help fund their work and improve the local capacity as well. Um, yeah, so I think your, your question really does, de it depends on what types of decisions you're talking about. Um, and, and yeah, at the, at the end of the day, there's a lot of aspects of human societies that are quite exposed to climate. Um, and sometimes we're well insulated from that in, in various societies which are well adapted to the climate. Um, and sometimes we're not. Uh, so, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, and Martin, you might have an interest then uh, in, in many of the, the, the pilot studies uh, within FCFA where we are looking at, at piloting the use of, of climate information in various decision-making contexts, um, particularly through various collaborative approaches to understand or explore how climate information integrates or, or maps onto um, other types uh, of information uh, and, uh, and other kind of developmental drivers and, and pressures. Um, so yeah, I would direct you to, to some of the resources on our, on our pilot uh, studies. I think just to, to, to follow up as well, um, these conversations that JP is talking about are sitting down with people that are making their decisions and understanding all of the, all of the various risks and um, inputs into those decisions. And so it's been quite open to the fact that sometimes climate information is not an important input at all. Uh, and then other times it is an important input. So um, part of that is ensuring that energy is spent on climate information where it is worthwhile and it isn't where it isn't. Uh, Neil, back to some of the fundamental science. Uh, Mary Kalavi is asking, are we likely to see a shift in the TC, the tropical cyclone track, over the southwestern Indian Ocean? Uh, thanks, Mary. I'm, I'm not actually clear on what the, what the current understanding on that is. There, there, there seems to be a growing understanding that we might get fewer tropical cyclones, but they'll be more intense. Um, but there's a huge amount of uncertainty because our models, so tropical cyclones are an interesting thing. They're quite large scale when they form, but to form, they start with individual thunderstorms. 
and those individual thunderstorms start interacting with each other and then they organize together and then they start spinning and cause a tropical cyclone. And because our models at the moment um, have to estimate the effect of thunderstorms and they can't simulate them directly, it's very difficult to know for sure what to believe about the models and what not to. But it is a, there's a lot of work going into that. Um, and yeah, I think the jury's still out on a clear answer of, of, of shifts of the tracks. But uh, yeah, hopefully that explains some of the, the issues around trying to do that accurately. Great. Jumping to uh, another region of, of interest to, to, uh, to Future Climate for Africa, um, which, is, which is East Africa. Uh, and uh, again, I'd note to uh, Peter Baker, who's posing this question, that um, we have a consortium under the umbrella program called High Crystal working in the region. Um, and it might be useful uh, having a seminar focusing on, on the region in, in detail. But um, Neil, in the, to the extent that you would like to answer this, um, models for East Africa tended to predict uh, wetter conditions, but the reality in recent years has been drier. And uh, you're familiar with the East African paradox. So uh, has this paradox been resolved now? Um, and are PPT models more accurate in recent years? Uh, I think it remains a paradox. Um, yeah, I, I don't work directly on that problem. Um, there might be some people on the line that do, but uh, yeah, at, at the moment it does remain a paradox and that's an example of where we are quite uncertain and there will be some models that do predict drying as well. So uh, the, the sign of change of precipitation, the future, the future change of precipitation for much of East Africa, the models that we have, and there's maybe 40 of them, they span all answers from drying to wetting um, even though that Horn of Africa area seems to have this particularly strong paradox problem. I, I won't say more on that. Great. Yeah. So, um, Peter, I might maybe direct your, your queries to, to, to the High Crystal Consortium. You can find more information on our website there. That's being led by uh, Professor John Marsham at the University of Leeds. Um, and I know that's a central question for some of their work. Um, another question from Ellen Kalmbach is, um, the importance of collecting local weather data is often repeated. Um, however, it's not always easy for local NGOs to set up meaningful collaborations with research institutes or MET services who will use this data further uh, to verify and improve, for instance, local climate models. Do you know of any schemes or initiatives which collect local weather observations at regional level or even continental or global level? Yeah, this is a it's, a, it's a big problem within the climate community. Um, the, the, the MET services across Africa are under a lot of pressure uh, financially and so they, they tend to hold on to the data. Um, it, it's expensive to maintain these sorts of records. Um, but even with the MET services and with uh, other um, people that collect data, uh, it's often through direct collaboration with people that trust can be established and then people ha hand across the data. Um, there's a really nice example in uh, the middle of South Africa where a farmer whose family has been there for 140 years or something, um, somebody who's working on climate in that region came across this farmer and the farmer is now having that data digi digitized um, and it's becoming available because those sorts of long records are, are very rare. Um, so uh, I think that there's definitely space for some sort of initiative where uh, sort of a Facebook for data or something where we can can go and start these conversations and link up with one another who, who have data or are needing data and working on it. But a lot of that, because it's at local scale, is going to be from climate researchers and adaptation practitioners and decision makers in those local areas um, having those conversations and realizing that uh, the um, sharing of this data is going to help a particular problem that they're addressing. Um, 
there are people that collate as much data as they can. There's, um, there's global data sets uh, such as maintained at the Climate Research Unit in East Anglia. Um, but if you look at those data sets, there's been a big decline in the data that's being put into them since about 2000. Um, part of that's related to the weather service uh, concerns I spoke about, um, but part of that's just it's very difficult to get hold of these data. And so, yeah, I mean, I know there's a lot of data available from uh, local field sites, especially from biology field sites, um, but the sharing of that data often is the moment happening on a one-to-one on a -one type of basis. Right, thanks Neil. I think we've, we've um, covered all of the, the questions that have been posted to date. Um, we've got five minutes remaining if anyone wants to, um, want to sneak in uh, a final question. Otherwise I might begin by, by thanking uh, Neil for his time. Um, uh, I think particularly the, the question and answer session, fielding questions from not only several regions, but also various uh, uh, kind of uh, parts of, of work, not only on climate science, but application and, and uh, data gathering, etc. So, Neil, thanks so much for your time um, and a very informative discussion. Um, we don't have uh, further questions. We have one more, let's see. Okay, uh, Rudo, a uh, question from Rudo Mamombe. Um, how best can we convey climate information to decision makers under uncertainty, being confident about the climate information as major decisions should be made? This is an issue of, Rudo, I take it, uh, how best to communicate climate information uh, given present uncertainties. Um, Neil, do you have any general pointers there? Yeah, Rudo, thanks for that question. Um, so I think the first thing is that sometimes having the conversation about what the decision is and how it's sensitive to climate information changes the game in terms of the uncertainty. Because it might be that the, 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 um, the sensitivity to climate, actually it's sensitive to a part of climate that we have a lot of confidence about the projections in. Um, so the first thing probably is to actually recognize that it's very difficult for the climate in information providers to just provide information that results in a good decision um, because the conversation is first needed to establish what the appropriate information is. And then it might be that um, rather than the climate information provider being able to provide one answer for the stream flow in the river, uh, they're able to provide a, a, a broad um, band of answers. And then what happens is the decision makers, and there, there are many tools becoming available, um, are able to build a decision that's not based on one stream flow, but is able to cope with a range of different stream flows. And so um, in that case, what the end, it, it's something like that the slide that I showed earlier. Uh, it's something like this, is that um, the, 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 the data, these dots are quite uncertain, they're all over the show, but we know which dots to believe and which not, dots not to believe, and then hopefully the decision maker has space to change their decision space to ensure that their, um, their, their decision is a good decision and is, is, is only likely to fail on very rare occasions and not very often. Um, so yeah, when there's large uncertainty, one needs to start thinking about uh, decision spaces um, rather than the best decision for the most accurate stream flow. Right. Um, Neil, with that, I think we, we have run out of time. And um, maybe if you can put on the, the final slide, which um, highlights the next two uh, webinars that we'll be hosting um, in, the, in the short term. Uh, firstly, we have Dr. Catherine Vincent from Klima Development Solutions, uh, and she'll be presenting on, on climate models and how they can be used in planning, so delving down into a bit more detail on what particular models are, are good for what particular types of decision-making contexts. 
Um, and that's also in reference to a publication you can find on our website. Uh, and then secondly, uh, with the date still to be confirmed, uh, Dr. Chris Jack from the University of Cape Town looking at decision-making processes in African development and what that means for climate science. And I think this will be particularly salient to many of the questions we had today about uh, how best to communicate or integrate climate information in, in complex decision-making contexts. Um, those are the ones for the foreseeable future. We are developing a, a longer-term calendar of events that, that uh, webinars that will span the, the, the length of the program up to 2019. So um, for the participants today, uh, thank you for the, the great questions. Uh, we'll be sending out a, a very brief uh, online survey to, to see whether this webinar has been interesting to you and helpful, and that will also give you an opportunity to uh, propose uh, topics for future discussion. Um, and a recording of this webinar will also be available on our YouTube channel uh, shortly. So uh, thanks again, Neil, and thanks for all the participants. And uh, hopefully, see you. Thank you very much.